Good afternoon, and welcome everyone to this beautiful place on this lovely November afternoon. It didn't rain, which is a good thing. Thank you for joining us in this beautiful space to celebrate the impact of President Jack Howard on the life of Lewis and Clark College. I want to acknowledge a number of special guests. First, I'm going to start with the baseball team. Over here, everyone, welcome baseball team. <laughs> And, in case you might not recognize, the men in orange and white are football team as well. <laughs> but most especially, I want to acknowledge our special guests, the Howard family, Ruth Howard, and uh, John and Carol Howard, and Linda and Emerson Fisher, thank you so much for being here to celebrate with us today. I speak for all of us here present when I say thank you for sharing your husband and your father with us for so many years, and thank you for being part of the life and the very fabric of this place yourselves. We're so glad you're here to celebrate today. My name is Amelia Wilcox, and I will be your moderator this afternoon. And I have a sneaking suspicion that the reason I was asked to do this is because I graduated in 1981, and I have a last name that begins with W, so I think I was one of the final diplomas handed out by President Howard. <laughs> but the truth is, I have very happily come home to roost in this place I love so well. And I have the great good fortune and joy of teaching our undergraduates who are every bit as wonderful as we say they are. I have a really fond memories of Jack Howard during his years here and my years as an undergraduate. And I'm deeply grateful for his vision of the school and his dedication to the college because it was that vision and that dedication that shaped my own education. And I'm delighted to say that my memories are neither unique nor singular. And you will have a chance to hear some wonderful stories and memories this afternoon. Several of the people who share this uh, dais with me are emeriti faculty. And emeriti is a title which means earned by service. All who share this stage have the honor of serving alongside Jack during his 21 years as president of this college. And I'm quite certain the memories they will recount will spark memories of your own. So after all is said and done, please plan to join us in STAM for a glass of wine and the chance to catch up with old friends and continue the celebration. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Barry Glasner, the 24th president of Lewis and Clark College. Barry joined the Lewis and Clark family three years ago and is a vocal and public advocate for the transformative value of a liberal arts education. Widely published, Barry's most recent musings include thoughts on what it's like to return to college for your reunion, suggestions on how students might go about the daunting task of choosing the right college for them, and a discussion of the life-changing effect and nature of living and learning abroad in college-based international education programs. Barry's duties as president require him to spend a great deal of his time off campus. But when he is here, he and, Bar he and Betsy happily continue the tradition of never dining alone, as many college presidents will tell you. And despite his schedule, Barry can be found pacing the sidelines at Griswold Stadium during football games, cheering on men and women's basketball, in Pamplin Sports Center, and front and center enjoying productions in Fur Acres Theater. Please welcome Barry Glasner to the podium.
Thank you, and it's my great honor to welcome all of you this afternoon and to thank you for joining us for this lovely tribute to Jack Howard. And this is, I believe, a most appropriate venue for remembering and sharing stories about Jack. In fact, we might refer to this as the chapel that Jack built. As a quick aside, in his later years, recalling the groundbreaking of this chapel, Jack wrote that it took place around the same time as another momentous event in his life, his first and only hole in one, <laughs> which was made at the 16th hole of the Waverly, Golf, uh, the Waverly Country Club, which Jack pointed out was a long 204 yards. Now you'd be hard pressed to walk that far on this beautiful campus today without encountering something that Jack built. One way of measuring the contributions to Lewis and Clark that Jack provided is by the numbers, the number of buildings constructed, the number of new faculty hired, the number of students enrolled, the number of fond memories from alumni from that era. All of those are indeed impressive numbers. But we can also measure Jack's contributions by the developments he guided. The merger of the Northwestern School of Law with the college, the transition of Lewis and Clark into an independent liberal arts college, the launch of the overseas and off-campus study program, which propelled this, this college from a regional college to a global presence. All of these metrics individually and collectively are impressive, but they do not form the sum total of Jack Howard's enduring legacy. To measure that legacy in full, we need to turn to the very high standard that he gave himself. In his foreword to Martha Francis Montague's History of the College's First Hundred Years, Jack wrote the following. When the final assessment is made, education is usually credited with the successful and remarkably rapid development of the economy and the social life of the United States. But the story of education is really the story of people with the ambition to solve worthy problems. People with the ambition to solve worthy problems. And such are the people Jack brought to this college. He brought them as faculty, he brought them as students, as staff, as trustees, as donors, as friends. And he brings them still. Their work is perhaps the truest measure of his legacy. Personally, I'm grateful that Betsy and I had a chance to get to know and spend some time with Jack and with Ruth. I benefited from Jack's wise counsel, from his support, and from his enthusiasm for the college, all of which he shared with me. So we're privileged to have the opportunity to hear this afternoon from some of the women and men who worked with Jack or built on his accomplishments in shaping the college to what we are today. I want to thank all of them for being here and speaking to us today, as well as the faculty, staff, and administrators who put this event together. And in particular, I want to thank Provost Jane Atkinson, who is right there, um, who put a very great deal of effort into putting together this lovely program today. And now it's my honor to introduce our first speaker. He holds three undergraduate degrees from Lewis and Clark, as well as an honorary doctorate he chaired our Board of Trustees for many years, and he continues serving the college as a life trustee. He and his father and their family have made an indelible impression on our campus and our community through their leadership and their philanthropy. And 20 years ago, his vision and his gift established the Pamplin Society of Fellows. Since then, the pursuit of scholarship and fitness at Lewis and Clark have never been the same. Please welcome Dr. Robert B. Pamplin, Jr. I knew Jack for more than 50 years. So I'm excited today to tell you a little bit about 
the great man. And he truly was. John R. Howard, this is about you. There was a high school basketball coach who was attempting to motivate his team to persevere through a very difficult season. Well, halfway through the season, he got all his players together. And he said to them, did Michael Jordan ever quit? Well, they yelled out, no. He went on, did Peyton Manning ever quit? Once again, the team said, no. Then he said, did Elmer McAllister ever quit? Well, there was a long silence. Well, finally, one of the team members was bold enough to say, who's Elmer McAllister? I've never heard of him. And the coach snapped back, of course you've never heard of him, he quit. John R. Howard arrived on the Lewis and Clark campus as president in 1960. Probably didn't need to tell you that because you've read all the cards out there. But these are some things that you probably didn't read. The college was poised to move up on a higher level of excellence, and this young Ohio-born man of just 38 could feel the pressure of that challenge. But he made up his mind. He would be remembered as someone who never quit no matter how demanding the call would be. For him, Lewis and Clark College would be one of the finest theaters to stage the value of a liberal arts education in this nation. Now, very seldom in life do you have the favor of having an association that offers unconditionally mankind's fabric of value such as these, integrity, patience, caring love, and teacher. Jack Howard was one of those rare people from whom he, we all gained inspiration, an inspiration that allowed us to write our own destiny and to become what we do. All things bright and precious fade so fast and might not come back. This may be true with the exception of those select few who have that unique gift of being what I think of as a legacy builder. For is their bequest, what they give us, that will really transform all of us into not just to be a part of history, but to really create history. Jack Howard's with, without equivocation, that true legacy builder. Beyond all those platitudes that have been attributed to Jack Howard, I've held fast to the persuasion that his conviction and practical statesmanship engineered a feeling of certainty Yes, we can. An accomplished fact that Lewis and Clark was not on an ornamental acquisition to greatness, but rather a conquest of achievement that we could fulfill. He was that kind of leader that brought us along, led us, and we felt we were linked into it, and we could become a part of it, and we too would be that legacy builder. So as we went through this, what really happened? We all escaped to our fantasy of where we envision Lewis and Clark as a recognized liberal arts leader west of the Mississippi. Jack led us to believe that this eager impulse was not an indulgence or a reverie or an illusion but an introduction to enthusiastic castle building. We were hooked and we loved it. And the castle he built absolutely overstepped our imagination. But Jack would always summon to contest praise attributed to just his execution. 
his first recognition would be to his beloved wife, Ruth. His admiration for Ruth would shine far above all, and everyone would instantly know of his great love for his wonderfully giving wife. Together, their contribution to Lewis and Clark, to Portland, to the state of Oregon, and yes, the nation, was remarkably significant. Well, presenting a line of notables to the Queen of England at a reception, some remarked to the Queen, boy, it must be a strain to meet so many strangers all at one time. Well, she responded, oh, it's not so difficult. It's not as bad as it may seem. You see, I seldom have to introduce myself. They seem to know who I am. The family of Lewis and Clark College will always know and remember John R. Howard, a legacy builder for all of us, and a man who taught us to never quit. Thank you, Dr. Pamplin. And before we go on, I have a little gift for you. I was glad that I didn't have to throw it to you, actually. <laughs> Our next speaker is Stephen Becker, or Beckham, Professor Emeritus of History. Dr. Beckham is an Oregon Professor of the Year, a dedicated scholar and educator who has galvanized generations of Lewis and Clark students. An historian whose interests and in scholarship ranges from the broad sweep of US history to the challenges of our Native American peoples, to the history of the Northwest, to the beautiful state of Oregon. Steve also has a deep and rich connection to the history of Lewis and Clark. If asked, he can take his historical interest to the micro level and tell you the genealogies of his many adoring students. Historian of place, historian of people, Steve has a prodigious memory. Please welcome Professor Emeritus Stephen Beckham. I'm pleased to be with you this afternoon. When I think of our friend Jack, particularly those of us who knew him, I believe that many of us might come up with the same words to describe this remarkable man. Friendly, poised, thoughtful, and generous. Jack faced some real challenges in 1960 when he became president of the college. There was a great need for additional faculty, a larger student body, a broader vision, vision, new buildings, and endowment. The college's endowment fund stood at $660,000 when he became president. That was exceedingly modest for a school that had national ambitions. Jack had a remarkable ability to forge ties with donors. He found friends who believed in higher education and the liberal arts, though they were not graduates of this college. He persuaded those friends to fund the ambitions and needs of the college for land, buildings, scholarship, endowment funds, and special projects. He created a network of donors who served both on the board of trustees 
as well as on a special board of overseers who were friends close to the college, but not in the decision-making role at the college. And I think back of some of those that we got to know who put their resources and energies into this institution. Robert B. Pamplin, Sr., Aubrey Watzik, William Swindell, Sr., Chester McCarty, Paul Bowley, Ed Stam, Arthur Fields, George and Agnes Flanagan, Edna Frank Holmes, the Templeton family, especially Herbert, Ruth, Paul, and Jane Bryson, a banker, Doris Swayze Bounds from Hermiston, and a local patron of the arts, Mary Miletus. These were all people that I came to know in serving on such mar remarkable devices as the Watsik Awards Committee that mixed trustees, friends, and faculty and staff together to make an annual award to those who'd made outstanding con contributions in the state of Oregon. Now, Jack's talent in recruiting overseers, trustees, and general friends was particularly remarkable because of the atmosphere in which he had to do that. The 1960s was the era of the Civil Rights Movement, the war in Vietnam, and the rise of environmentalism. There were lots of agendas beyond education that shaped the course of the college, and it was his talent and diplomacy that was able to sustain relationships even when those donors who were so important to the development of the institution might not have agreed with the agendas of faculty and students on campus. Jack also put together a remarkable management program for the college. He hired and held a loyal staff. I remember going to his office and I would encounter Olive Lohr, Lois Jorgenhausen, and faculty emerita Edith Smith, who stayed on and worked here into her 90th year as a knowledgeable person and part of his administrative team in the manor. John Brown as Dean of Faculty, Glenn Gregg, Trustee Relations and Investments, Bill Mallinson, a remarkable business manager who walked the campus and I believe knew every groundskeeper and every faculty member by name. Cliff Hamar and Mary Diamond in Overseas Studies, Charles Charnquist in Public Relations, and his close colleague, Marianne Normandon, in dealing with public issues. That was a team that worked well during his tenure, and certainly during the years that I had served here on the faculty. Jack was an effective communicator, particularly with the campus community, and he had some clever devices. I think one of the most clever were what were called the Executive Council Minutes. It was basically a dean's council that considered issues that faced the campus like dogs and cars and drinking. And about six months after the, uh, six weeks after the executive council had considered the issue, out came a little folder of uh, a fold up of typed minutes that at least let us know that these matters that were issues on campus had caught the attention of the administration and been, ad been addressed. And they always came, the minutes came out when it was too late to protest or do anything about it anyway. He also had a remarkable way of communication in terms of those one-on-one -on -one sessions in his office. I always felt better after we'd had a conversation about some issue and I left to go back to my office or the classroom. And he was well aware of the importance of informal fellowship such as maintaining the Dubach dining room over in Templeton Center, where staff and faculty had a chance to meet for coffee or lunch and actually get quite a bit of business done during the course of those friendly conversations. There were the end of the year academic retirement events at the president's home, where his gracious wife, Ruth, was clearly a major player as she was in so much of what happened here at the college. Now the faculty at that point was too large for us all to go on one evening, so Jack and Ruth had two end-of-year gatherings back-to-back, 
And what was particularly special were the gifts that were selected for the Watzik Library, a remarkable book in the field of study or teaching of the faculty member who was retiring. It was building the legacy of the college through those gifts to the institution and also giving validation to the professor who'd served their years here at the institution. The Christmas gala, which got a little bit out of hand, drew so many friends and visitors uh, uh, that it was hard to tell uh, what quite was the event, but it was part of the fellowship of the institution. Jack had a very interesting institutional vision. He believed that change often came from outside, not internally, and that a college must be open to a diversity of ideas, opinions, and personalities. He helped the college to move from its Presbyterian origins and commitments to independent status. And the very first assignment he gave me when I came here was to be a faculty representative to a Presbyterian Synod committee to discuss the ways that the college would disentangle itself from the Presbyterians. Mission accomplished. Bob has mentioned the pursuit of the merger with Northwestern College of Law, a very important part of vision. And there were others. Jack wanted very much to capitalize upon the college's name, Lewis and Clark, and its location in the Pacific Northwest. Thus, he engaged Seattle architect Paul Thierry, a champion of an emergent Northwest sky style of design for such remarkable buildings as the Anglis Flanagan Chapel and the Albert Watzik Library. This chapel echoes the design of a Northwest Coast Indian chief's basketry hat, as do the broad eaves and exterior design elements on Watzik Library. He was helping us develop a sense of place. He supported the development of a public administration program because he had a couple eager professors named Don Balmer and Gus Mattersdorf who were well aware that Portland was the headquarters for the U.S. Forest Service, Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Bureau of Land Management, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs here in the Pacific Northwest. There were dozens and dozens of younger or mid-career executives working for those federal agencies who hungered for a return to college, an intensive semester program that would put them back in the classrooms at a place like Lewis and Clark. And that program hummed during Jack's presidency. It not only enriched, enriched their lives, it enriched those of us on the faculty who were privileged to work with learners aged 35 to 50 who really tested our skills and asked us those wonderful probing questions. And in terms of institutional vision, Jack, working with Dean John Brown, felt that there was a place at Lewis and Clark College for a professor to teach on the history of the American West, the Pacific Northwest, and Native Americans. And I was ready and eager when the job description came out to make a change and come to Portland to teach those subjects. They seem to be unnatural for a school located here and bearing the names of two of the most famous explorers in American history. Now there was a challenge that came with that appointment for me some 37 years ago. There was an NEH grant that was to fund library development and there were $7,000 earmarked for Western history and Native American materials. The problem was it needed to be triple matched, and Jack hadn't found a donor. I was pretty anxious about that because those were the materials I needed to get those classes underway and to have my students engage their level of research in primary sources that I felt was absolutely essential. So I thought about it, and finally I, I went to him, and I said, President Howard, I was a little shy that first year, but President Howard, I have some ideas about where we might get that $21,000 to 
complete that match so I can get about the job of buying those materials for the library. He said, oh, what do you have in mind? I said, well, I have a friend that lives down the road here in Dunthorpe. His name is Ed Hayes. And Ed and I have talked history together. We've had lunch together when he's invited me to the Arlington Club. I said, I, I'm confident enough that I could explain to Ed and Anna Hayes that we really need $21,000. And President Howard said, go for it, young man. Go ask them. And I did. And we got the check within three weeks. And that teaching career that I had so looked forward to at Lewis and Clark matured very handsomely. Jack had an interesting philosophy of the college presidency. When we were working on his retirement program on John Howard the Builder, after 21 remarkable years, the longest tenure of any president in the history of the college, he said to me, never put your foot down until you have the, one, the other one ready for the next step. Or in other words, the labors of a college president are never done. The role of the president of an institution is to keep on moving. Thank you. And now I'm delighted to introduce you to Dinah Dodds, Professor Emerita of German. Dinah is a quintessential example of what Lewis and Clark uh, fosters lifelong cross-disciplinary curiosity and a passion for internationalism. Dinah came to us as a professor of German. Her dedication to international education, a critical element of a Lewis and Clark education, is very well known. But Dinah also arrived here with an abiding love for music and for singing. In fact, she sang with Gil Seeley's Oregon Repertory Singers from its inception. How do these seemingly separate things come together? Well, after Dinah retired from the college, the music department was in need. And Dinah threw her energies into serving as chair of that department for two years. We are fortunate for the depth of her engagement with the college, and please welcome Professor Emerita of German and immediate past chair of the music department, Dinah Dodds. I was a young 28 years old when Jack Howard interviewed me in 1972 for a position on the German faculty. That job lasted 36 years. Why I stayed at Lewis and Clark so long can be attributed to many things, including wonderful colleagues and students. But one thing stands out, the overseas program. My experience as fac faculty leader for four programs was so rich, I could not imagine teaching anywhere else. I didn't take students to Germany or Austria, as one might expect, but to Thailand, Kenya, Australia, and Scotland. And that was all part of Jack Howard's vision and his legacy. Lewis and Clark's overseas programs were Jack's idea and bear his imprint. In the early 60s, the story goes, student enrollment was increasing faster than dorms could be built. And in response to pressure for space, Jack created one of the most innovative overseas study programs in the country. He saw study abroad as an extension of the classroom where students could develop critical thinking in ways not possible on campus. This included homestays, were, which were very rare at the time, and provided unique experiential learning opportunities. He wanted students to go out, to observe, 
to analyze. And when they came back, he wanted to know what they had learned. And he and Ruth invited overseas groups to their home for dinner. Study abroad at that time was pretty much limited to countries of Western Europe. But in 1962, the first year of Lewis and Clark's program, four of the five study groups went to non-European countries. Those first five programs were Chile, Peru, Mexico, Japan, and England. Even today, when most schools have jumped on the study abroad bandwagon, our programs stand out for the great variety and number of Western and non-Western countries visited. For example, the programs scheduled for, 19, uh, for 2014 and 2015 include, in alphabetical order, Australia, Chile, China, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, East Africa, Ecuador, France, Germany, Ghana, Ireland, Italy, Morocco, New Zealand, Japan, Russia, Scotland, Senegal, Spain, and Vietnam. The success of the overseas program in the 60s led to the establishment of our off-campus programs in the US. Political science in Washington, DC in 1965, and art and theater in New York City in 1972. The number and variety of programs is truly remarkable and has become a hallmark of Lewis and Clark's curriculum. Our programs stand out in another way, faculty leadership. Jack's original vision made sure that strong communities would form between students and faculty during the time abroad. Faculty learn alongside students, and students get to know faculty on a personal level not possible on campus. These communities persist after graduation, and reunions of overseas programs form an important part of Alumni Weekend. Leading an overseas program can be a powerful form of faculty development. As faculty acquire expertise in a new field or gain new perspective on their own field. My colleague, Del Smith, told me that he looked at his discipline of public health more critically after taking overseas programs to Kenya and India. During my 1982 program in Thailand, I pursued a research project, as did all the students, for which I interviewed young women working in prostitution. This work resulted in a publication that fell quite a bit outside my field of normal research of German literature, but it had a lasting impact on me, and after uh, the fall of the wall, I conducted interviews with women living in East Berlin that later became a book. The impact of overseas study programs on the curriculum has been considerable. Our first ever undergraduate exchange program in China in 1981 led to courses in Mandarin and eventually to a minor in Chinese. Similarly, the development of a student-scholar exchange in 1988 in Khabarovsk, the Soviet Union, supported the development of a minor in Russian. While overseas, students can satisfy general education as well as major requirements. All students majoring in foreign languages are required to spend at least one semester studying abroad, and many stay a full year. Overseas programs are not an add-on to the curriculum. They are fully integrated into it. Jack, as you have heard, was open to all ideas 
as the programs in China and Khabarovsk demonstrated. As early as 1965, students went to Yugoslavia for the first college group to undertake prolonged formal academic work behind the Iron Curtain. The impact of overseas study cannot be overstated. As it says in your program, close to 11,500 students and 275 faculty have taken part in 828 overseas and off-campus programs in 68 countries. Over 50% of Lewis and Clark students study abroad. These are very big numbers for a college of our size. Students return from their overseas experience and end up in places they never dreamed. We are one of the country's largest per capita contributors to the Peace Corps, and our students receive significant numbers of postgraduate scholarships, including a very high number of Fulbrights, both for research and for teaching English abroad. LC graduates often return to their site of study and stay. Alumni now live in cities around the world, such as Guilin, China, and over 40 live in Munich. Far ahead of his time, Jack Howard created a program in the true liberal arts tradition. He wanted students to become contributing citizens and saw overseas and off-campus study as a way to achieve that. As he wrote in his 2001 memoir, quote, the overseas program continues to be the centerpiece of Lewis and Clark's academic offering, unquote. This legacy lives on in our present curriculum. We are who we are because of his vision. Lansing began his connection to Lewis and Clark without even knowing it. When, as a young lawyer, he began to teach part-time at what was simply known as Northwestern, a small school of law housed downtown in Portland. Huddleston House on the Lewis and Clark campus became the next stop on Ron's and the law school's journey. And finally, they settled together on the beautiful property along Tryon Creek where Lewis and Clark Law School lives today. Ron Lansing, Professor of Law Emeritus at Lewis and Clark Law School, formerly known as Northwestern School of Law of Lewis and Clark College, before that, Northwestern College of Law. Whew. Welcome, Ron, to the podium. <laughs> Okay, let's see. You're, uh, you're 37 years old. It's 1960. You've just been made the president of a school in the far-flung Pacific Northwest. It's an old school. It's been around for almost a century at that time, in 1960. It um, calls itself the Pioneers. You're something of a pioneer yourself. You, uh, you fit together. You, uh, they, need a, they need buildings. You're a builder. You're the Carnegie of libraries, uh, sports centers, science centers, uh, resident dormitories, uh, theater houses, uh, lots of dormitories and resident halls. 
20 structurings or more around campus. And oh yeah, a, uh, over there in the Tryon Forest, a little bit off campus, curious, obscure, three, three buildings over there. And that begets my story. You, uh, you're not just uh, brick and mortar. You're also, you also build programs. And keep with that comes, uh, comes along an opportunity. A local Portland school is looking to align itself with a college such as yours. The law school, too, is venerate. It's born in 1884, one of the three oldest law schools in the West. Evening education taught by judges and practicing lawyers. Taught, and uh, it comprises, uh, its graduates comprise more than, or almost, one half of the lawyers in Oregon one-third of the judges in Oregon. Strongly provincial and parochial, however, it is the oldest law school in the nation never to have sought national recognition. Now it does. As a first step on that pursuit, it seeks joinder with an accredited college. Four other schools are uh, interested and compete for that. University of Oregon, uh, University of Portland, Portland State College, it was a college then, uh, Reed College. You join the competition, but that uh, brings internal contest at home on campus. Some friends, trustees, some college faculty, Wonder about a legal education on campus that may be a bite that more the college can chew financially. You are not deterred. You compete and win. In September 1965, a merger agreement is signed. It's um, two venerate frontier schools put their gray heads together under the name Northwestern School of Law of Lewis and Clark College. Some think that uh, a done deal, it's a done deal, it's over now. Mm -mm, nope, nope. But contesting is far from over. It has just begun. A second kind of merger must be pursued. It's called accreditation. It means joining two national societies. They are formidable. The nation's lawyers and the nation's law educators. The American Bar Association and the American Association of Law Schools. Each with its own distinct standards for acceptance. Their dealings will be different experience in merger because they bring their own deck and hold all the cards. Kind of like competing on the gridiron or the diamond uh, against the umpires instead of the opposing team. Uh, <clears throat> ahead are uh, many hurdles. First, first required you hire a law dean and a law faculty of four lawyers who give up their law practices in order to serve as career professors of law. I know because I was one of them. Then um, soon you soon learn that law deans are a, a strong-willed breed, armed with argument that some might call obstinance. After just seven months at the helm, the new dean openly criticizes the slow process by which accreditation is being chased. You and he clash. He surprisingly tenders his resignation. Uh, and uh, 
you, to end at the end of his uh, academic year, you fire him at once. That becomes an early omen of what would be a hurt, a hunt. Hurt works too. Much longer than the 24 months initially anticipated. Wait for accreditation will in fact take 100 months. A creditor hesitation hangs on these further demands so far unmet. Daytime law schooling must be instituted. Endowment and student scholarship funds must be bigger. Student faculty ratios, bar exam passage rates, faculty salaries, admission standards must be improved. Clinical education must be launched. A professional law li librarian must be hired. Law library volumes have to be eight times larger than the current 8,000 volumes. $64,000 are the bare minimum for library, law library books. Today we have half, uh, half a million of those. Finally, and most of all, most of all, there had to be a uh, law education plant, separate building to house law learning. Some of the ABA accreditors express doubt that you can achieve such goals. Likewise on campus, the naysayers who were unsure of merger in the first place now have reason for greater unrest at what seems to be a losing cause. You, however, are steadfast and undaunted you see beneath the face of dread. You see the challenge that is there instead. Accordingly, you and the Board of Trustees launch a tremendous $2 million fund drive and promise accreditors that it will be reached. That's the equivalent of a reach for $12 million in today's inflationary terms. Once again, the ABA creditors shake their heads. They see the promise as much too ambitious. Besides, they say, achievement, not promise, is what the standards uh, are for, call for. So with that dare, you pick up the gauntlet laid down and then behold, you fulfill the promised funding. It takes just 16 months to do so. In fact, you exceed it and raise the equivalent of what is today 13 to 14 million dollars. Accreditors are amazed, calling it, quote, phenomenal growth, unquote. Soon you are able to present to the accreditors not just promise and not just the cash in hand, but also the full attainment of what funding brings. Day education, a law librarian, a law library of 70,000 books, uh, and buildings uh, in a law complex in the nearby Tryon Forest. Mission accomplished. Full accreditation is bestowed from both the American Bar and the American Association of Law Schools. It's the first of 1974 now. Celebration ensues. For you, however, that is not fulfillment. Your vision and daring does not stop at other people's good enough. It is not just the standards of accreditors that had to be satiate. One's own pride of accomplishment is what has to be filled. And so, three years after accreditation, you master the construction of a fourth law building in the Tryon Forest Complex, the largest building of all. Amazingly, 
you cause all this phoenix rising while outside a world of turbulence beats upon your campus doors. This is, after all, the roaring 1960s. Where abounds hot and cold war, pop, population pollution and nuclear concerns, charged with student protests, civil rights demonstrations, and political riots, punctuated by White House burglary and tricks, plus purges and impeachment, and capped by fatality in the form of slayings on an Ohio campus, and worst of all, assassinations. Within such violence and its voices, null and naysay, down, doubt, and do, you do not flag, you hold together. Yours are not the breaking of ribbons at finish lines. Yours are the shots that open starting gates. You know only one direction to go, forward. Your college honors you. Your law school thanks you for believing. You are John, Jack, Raymond, Howard. I am delighted to introduce you to our next presenter, Vern Jones, and I am happy to tell you that I had a very Lewis and Clark experience with him during my sophomore year on this campus, when I was his one and only student in a self-designed adolescent psychology class. It was my first introduction to close reading of the scientific literature in the field of psychology, and I remember those Friday afternoons in Albany very, very well. That was back when education was an undergraduate major, and long before South Campus became our own. Vern has been around to see many changes in his years on this campus. He is also a prolific scholar, and pay close attention, everyone, because I am talking to you. He is an expert in classroom management. So if you're feeling a little bit fidgety right now, he will notice. <laughs> Please welcome Professor of Teacher Education, Vern Jones, to the podium. Well, thank you. It is uh, truly an honor to be here to speak about Dr. Jack Howard's uh, contributions to Lewis and Clark. I can speak about really through three types of experiences. Uh, I came here as a student in 1965 and was a student from 65 to 68. Jack hired me as a faculty member in 1973, and so I was here during his last three year, or eight years as president, and I met him several times uh, in retirement. So I'm going to talk about those three categories. I first met Jack as a student uh, in spring of 1965. I ran track, and Jack, as he did with many other student activities, was frequently at track meets or track practices, um, as he was at uh, music performances, theater performances, student government issues. Um, and he constantly would ask us about how we were doing, um, what our goals were, what our ambitions were. It wasn't just coming to a track meet, it was actually uh, engaging us. I remember, uh, secondly, that Jack uh, used to have presidential assemblies, a bold thing to do in those days, uh, where we could chat with him about anything from food services to government, student government and issues on campus. I was always impressed uh, with a couple things. Jack knew more students on campus than I can imagine. I've been a vice principal in a middle school of a thousand kids, and I think I knew the 50 that I had to discipline on a regular basis. Jack knew virtually, I, just an amazing number of students. Uh, and he had a faith in students and a sincere um, pride in student accomplishments that I always found uh, very, very impressive. 
Um, there were a number of times when he would stop and, and chat with me about my goals. Was I going to go to graduate school? Was I going to do an overseas trip? How were my classes going? Um, it was really, it's quite amazing to hear all the things that Jack uh, was involved in accomplishing and realize that he had that kind of relationship with students. It was, I, I will tell you, I think my advisor didn't know much more about me than, uh, than Jack did. Uh, another thing that impressed me as a student was his deep commitment to, to the liberal arts. Uh, it caused him to encourage and even cherish dialogue as an expression of free thought and intellectual curiosity. The number of speakers, the quality, the diversity of speakers that he brought to this campus, not only when I was a student, but uh, later on, is just uh, very, very impressive and enriched the lives of, of so many students. Another example of my uh, involvement with Jack uh, while I was a student involved this distinguished building. Um, I was not a very political being in college. I ran track and tried to get good grades so I could afford graduate school and didn't do much else. But uh, when this chapel was being conceptualized and initially uh, constructed, uh, I and a few other people were concerned that there was no place for individuals of various uh, religious beliefs to, to worship. No small, quiet area. There was a chapel, and that was it. So um, I talked to Jack about it and uh, expressed my concern. And his response was basically, you've spent four years here earning a liberal, a fine liberal arts education, and I respect your ability to uh, responsibly present your case and do it in a way that represents you and the college well. And so we wrote some letters and we picketed the building. I think the only picture I've ever seen of myself on this campus outside the track was standing in front of the building. Um, and I so deeply appreciated Jack's willingness to have a dialogue rather than to simply cut things off. And we've heard that his vision of student involvement, both locally and, uh, and globally, uh, demonstrated once again his belief in what students could do and what the kind of education uh, they needed. Then as a faculty member, uh, I was hired by the search committee, obviously, but by Jack in the fall of 1973. I'll never forget my interview with Jack. Um, it really was like an advising session. Uh, what was I interested in? Uh, what did I want to do over the next 10 years? What did I think I could contribute to the college? How could the being here enrich my uh, future experience? At the same time, I had a couple other offers, but one was at the University of Oregon to run their doctoral master's degrees in behavioral disorders. And um, I chose here, and I chose here really for two main reasons. One is a relationship I had with Jack as a student and how much I respected him at that time. And secondly was that interview. The difference between that and any other interview I had and have had any time in my career was uh, quite impressive. During the eight years uh, that I served under Jack before he retired, I had numerous opportunities to meet with him as a faculty member and chat uh, about my work here and my work uh, with, on the track with Eldon Fix and lots of things. Uh, we took an overseas trip, my wife and I, in 1978, and I recalled uh, several of the in fact, I think all of the faculty members that were taking winter spring trips went over to Ruth and Jack's and uh, talked about our trips and uh, shared some of our anxieties about it. And when we came back, our students were invited over and had a delightful um, evening. I can remember, the, like Steve, the warm events with Jack and Ruth's house. And, and uh, also, I particularly remember when professors were retiring. And it wasn't just the gift. It was Jack's understanding of who those people were his deep respect for them, his knowledge about their careers, their families, um, his respect for faculty and his um, commitment to and liking of faculty has always, always impressed me. He, uh, as he did with students, he encouraged dialogue. I, we had many faculty meetings that were uh, quite intense. Uh, we had some interesting uh, intellectual dialogue with a fair amount of emotion, and Jack uh, always encouraged and supported that kind of dialogue. I felt that um, he created a situation where my ideas, uh, my scholarship, my work uh, could really be the best it could be. It's interesting to me how many faculty that were hired by Jack or who experienced Jack as a president stayed here and spent ye their entire career at Lewis and Clark College. And I might say at a time when going elsewhere was very possible. I think most of us that, that were hired in the, certainly in the 60s and 70s uh, had some opportunities because college jobs were, there were quite a few of them around, and m many of us stayed here, myself included, because of the kinds of experiences that Jack created in this community. In planning for this event, I had some correspondence uh, with uh, Dr. Zahir Wahab, who some of you know. He was here for 39 years as a colleague of mine. He's currently 
uh, doing some amazing work under real peril of his life and has for a number of years in Afghanistan. Uh, probably one of the men, uh, one of the professionals, but also one of the men in my lives that I have most respect for. And we chatted electronically about our experiences with Jack, had a lot of fun over the last uh, week or so doing that. But at the end, his last paragraph, I want to read you, and I have his permission to do so, what he wrote. And this is a person that was probably the most socially active uh, social activist and, and radical politician, I think, in, if not in the history, probably, I see some faculty smiling, probably in the history of this college. Uh, and he wrote, so he wrote, I liked, trusted, and respected him more than all the presidents and deans since. He was a decent and dedicated man and president. I think about him often. And I can tell you that I reflect Zahir's comments. Lastly, I want to tell you a brief story about uh, something that happened uh, when Jack was retired. My wife and I were vacationing in um, Palm Springs, and some friends of ours, Ed and Jean uh, Groman from our church, uh, invited us to visit them at their community and the little house on the golf course and have lunch at the clubhouse. And so we did. And but, oh, not far into the conversation, they said, well, Vern, you work at Lewis and Clark. You, did you ever know Jack? And so I started off uh, about how important Jack had been in my life and how much respect I had for him. And one of them left, I thought, to use the restroom, came back in a couple minutes. About five minutes later, someone put their hand on my shoulder and said, Vern, good to see you. And I looked up, and it was Jack. And we had a conversation for probably half an hour that was as warm and spirited as any I'd had for a while. And that... Oh, and, and then he had to leave. He had to go to a meeting, which, as humble as Jack, I knew Jack to be. I ne didn't know until um, Ed told me that it was the Homeowners Association, and not surprisingly, Jack was president. Um, but uh, he was a little late to the meeting because he was chatting. This meeting highlighted so well to me the way I experienced Jack, a kind, engaging, thoughtful man who was sincerely interested in those around him and treated me and other faculty and students as a colleague, friend, and almost a family member. I've had the good opportunity, the good fortune to spend a lot of my time working with administrators. I've been an administrator in three school districts. I've worked in, I think I total up 100 school districts in 25 states. I've worked at eight universities as a consultant and, and ran our doctoral program at, at leadership. So I have worked with and known a lot of administrators. And I will tell you that I've never worked with anyone who combined the ability to know and care about students and faculty, encourage dialogue, and provide a sense of leadership and community the way Jack did. He had a major impact, as you've heard, on this college and on my life. And as a faculty member alumni, I, like many, many graduates of this institution and certainly faculty, am grateful to him for his leadership and his friendship. Thank you. And now, I want to welcome our last speaker, Gene Ward. When Jean joined the undergraduate faculty in 1964, we had no gender studies program, no gender studies symposium, no affirmative action, and very few women faculty. And now look at us. Over her years at Lewis and Clark, Jean has served as a beloved professor, assistant and associate dean of the College of Arts and Sciences Director of Inventing America, Chair of the Communication Department, and she spent 16 years as Director of our Gender Studies Program. We have Jean to thank for so elegantly and eloquently answering the question of how to capture the essence of Jack Howard for today's program. It is Jean who framed his life in prose for our program and displays, and she who together with Doug Erickson and Zach Selly conceptualized the pieces on display in Greg Pavilion this afternoon. This project is a lovely example of the seriousness and the accessibility of Jean's scholarship, scholarship the college has benefited from since 1964. Please welcome to the podium, Professor Emerita of Communication, Jean Ward. Vern talked about his interview. I'm gonna talk about my interview in just a moment. 
But as Vern was describing how important that interview was to him, it reminded me of what I've heard in the last few weeks from a number of Ameritai faculty. One example, when he heard that we would be honoring Jack Howard's legacy today, and that I intended to say something about my interview, this faculty member said, I can't be there, but if you have a chance to tell them, I was interviewed and hired at Penn State. I was interviewed and hired at UC Davis. And then when I decided I wanted a smaller liberal arts institution where I could teach, I was interviewed and hired at Lewis and Clark. And of all those interviews, the one with Jack Howard at Lewis and Clark will be forever in my memory as one of the most rewarding experiences I have ever had in higher education. I just wanted to share that with you. You're probably sitting there wondering, well, she's the sixth speaker. Is she going to go really long, or is it going to be short and sweet? I'll try to hit somewhere in between. After all, a balance makes sense in this world. A bit of my story and that first interview. In the spring of 1964, I was 26 at the time, I interviewed at Lewis and Clark for a possible position as an instructor of, it was then called speech, and debate coach. Now, after meeting with the search committee, I was escorted to the manor house to have a session with President Howard. I was ushered into the main floor office, the library den of the manor house, the walls lined with books, a welcoming fireplace, windows looking out to the terraced gardens in the east, the grandfather clock ticking just outside in the hall. The warmth of that room, for me, reflected the warmth of the man who interviewed me. Following an engaging conversation, Jack suggested a walk across campus in the afternoon sunshine. He happily greeted every person we met by name, faculty, students, staff, and he showed personal interest in all. His smile was contagious, and his interpersonal skills quite remarkable. Then Jack remembered, ah, a birthday party going on in the basement of the manor house in the uh, business office. We crashed that party, and once again, Jack's people skills were apparent when we enjoyed the cake and good company. By the end of the afternoon, it was clear to me that this gifted and charming man had a genuine love for the college and for the people who comprised this community. Ultimately, I accepted the offer to come to Lewis and Clark in the fall of 1964. I continued here until retirement in 2006. Jack Howard was always supportive of the forensics program and everyone involved. Just last week, an excellent debater from the Howard years told me he still remembered the thrill of receiving a handwritten note from the president of the college congratulating him on his forensic success. Not until recently, however, while reading Jack's memoir, did I discover that he had been both a debater and a debate coach. Despite his experience, he never questioned or interfered with my role as coach. Thank you for trusting me and letting me fly with my own wings, Jack. Jack's debate experience served him very well. He was an advocate for freedom of speech and for hearing all sides on any issue. An excellent public speaker, both from manuscript and extemporaneously, he was invited to address many audiences throughout his 21 years as president. Imagine now, in his first year, an average of 13 speeches per month and an annual total of 156 different speeches. And he was only warming up. 
Jack Howard's off-campus service and leadership made many new friends for the college, and the sense of community grew. Here are but a few examples, but probably enough to make one's head spin a bit. President of the Oregon Independent Colleges Association and the Oregon Independent Colleges Foundation, helped organize and served on the board and as president of the Northwest Association of Independent Colleges and Universities chair of the Educational Coordinating Council for the State of Oregon, National Commission for Accreditation, Washington, D.C., chair Northwest Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, National Board of the Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, Portland Commission on Race and Education, Advisory Council, I Have a Dream Foundation, Board of Governors of the City Club, Board of Directors of the Portland Art Museum, Committee for Development of Tryon Creek State Park, President Portland Rotary Club, Chair, Federal Reserve Board, Portland Branch, Director and Chair of Blue Cross of Oregon, helped negotiate the merger of Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Board of Directors, Northwest Natural Gas, and President, National Commission for the 25th anniversary of the United Nations. And that, folks, is only a partial list. Now, one might ask, with his combination of leadership skills and the academic study in his field of political science. Did Jack Howard seek a career in politics? In his memoir, Jack wrote that in the mid-1960s, a leading Republican, a kingmaker in the state, asked if he would consider a career in politics, perhaps as a candidate for governor. Howard followed with one sentence. I decided that I would not seek public office. Now, I choose to believe that Jack Howard made this decision first because of his family, his lovely wife, wife Ruth, his three children, John, Linda, and Becky, but also because he had a devotion to higher education specifically to Lewis and Clark College. One note about his family. He wrote of Ruth, my one best girl, my wife and my best friend. They had met at the University of Pennsylvania where both studied political science. And everyone should know that she was an outstanding student there and when she completed that degree here at Lewis and Clark. And throughout their married life, Ruth joined Jack in every endeavor. Thank you, Ruth. Jack's vision for Lewis and Clark included replacement of the temporary and converted structures on the Fur Acres campus. His success with the construction of well over 20 new buildings, plus remodeling and expansion of others, earned him the epithet of a man with an edifice, com edifice complex, a title he happily accepted. In January of the centennial year, 1967, the Pioneer Log reported on the front page about the man with the edifice complex, announcing the centennial year opens campus construction to highlight LC's 100th year. And the accompanying story told of the success of the Capitol campaign, along with descriptions and sketches of some of the planned buildings. Yet, Jack Howard reminded everyone in his annual report the next year, buildings, powerful through their influence, do not make a college. That is left to the people. Which brings us to one of Jack Howard's finest legacies developing a Lewis and Clark community that respects academic freedom and freedom of speech. At the banquet for the dedication of the John R. Howard Building in 2005, John Brown, the former dean of the faculty, said, for his 21 years at Lewis and Clark, John Howard was a champion of the principle of academic freedom and the principle of freedom of speech on this campus. Here are but a few illustrations. You'll find more in your program. The Institute for the Study of Man 
in the 1970s. Drawn to the investigation of parapsychology, Jack Howard believed passionately that, quote, the whole world of education could be changed if we were to explore and understand the possibilities of the subconscious mind in learning, end quote. He appointed a faculty committee to advise on incorporating such a program, an institute for the study of man, within the college. The committee recommended that the curricular proposal was not in the best interests of the college at the time. Jack kept what must have been deep disappointment to himself and accepted the committee's recommendation with his characteristic grace, showing his respect for members of the faculty and the principles of academic freedom. I can attest to this because I served on that committee. To keep lines of communication open with students, Jack Howard held monthly open meetings with them as part of his community building. By 1968-69, with increased, as he referred to it, awareness, a number of changes had been made. A free university established. The Black Student Union founded. Students organized Black History Week. A community cabinet was formed with six students, six faculty, and six executive officers. And the first student trustee meeting was held. Finally, as a last example, students occupied the manor house. The student occupation of the manor house underscores, again, respect for academic freedom and freedom of speech throughout the Howard years. Protesting against the Vietnam War and the bombing of Cambodia, students entered the manor house, happened to find no one in the president's office, and locked themselves in. Now, when Jack arrived back at the manor house and met with the students, he told them that he, quote, would call an all-college assembly, giving them an appropriate forum for their statements and concerns. The students agreed. Unlike circumstances on many campuses in this turbulent era, an agreement was reached without even bringing in campus security. And as a footnote to this, I love the account by former Dean of Faculty Jack Brown, or John Brown, rather, who said, as he watched all of this story unfolding, the students leaving Jack Howard's office paused in the hallway because they had accidentally knocked over a palm and the dirt was on the floor and the palm plant was put back upright and they even cleaned up the dust and dirt on the rug. Jack later reflected, the college was not to experience disruptions of that type, the manor house, again during my administration. And I'd like to think, he said, that my earlier support of the students' right to hear speakers of their own selection and my willingness to debate all controversial policies earned their respect. Yes, Jack, you earned respect from all of us and reminded us often of the principles of academic freedom and free speech. In 1981, the year of your retirement, the student annual praised your leadership, writing, President Howard has continued to attract support from all segments of the community while weathering countless storms. His administration has dealt with and learned from the student protests following, following Kent State, Vietnam, and Cambodia, a community uproar over a speaking invitation to communist leader Gus Hall, and student marches protesting funding priorities during chapel construction, just to name a few. We're all very fortunate that Agnes Flanagan and her husband George had very good senses of humor, as it turned out, and were quite supportive of students 
protesting when they felt the need to do so. That's also found in Jack's memoir. This place, this college, is better, Jack Howard, because you passed this way and gave us a gift in the Howard years to be remembered and treasured, a gift of true community. Love and respect and regard earned by service. What a remarkable man. And this place is so much the better for him. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And thank you every single person who helped put this program together. And if you want to know who they are, please turn your program over to the back. There's a lengthy list of names. Please know that the exhibits from the Gregg Pavilion have been moved to STAM, and I'm happy to tell you that the timeline is going to find a permanent home in the lobby of Howard Hall. So that will be with us forever, and our students will be able to know from whence they came. Anybody who's been in my psychology classes knows that the child is father to the man, and this institution is a great example of that. We are looking forward to catching up with all of you in STAM, so please, thank you for coming, and adjourn to STAM. Bye.